great to see you all. Good day to be out. And uh, we have a great guest with us today. And so he's come all the way from South Africa, Wayne Royce. And it's funny is that uh, he came to visit here when I was new. And so he was new on being a missionary and I was new being here and we kind of formed a partnership. And so it's lasted for multiple years, hasn't it? And we got old together. <laughs> we got All right. Together. So you know what? Since you're here, how about if you just stand in place and open us in prayer? Okay. Let's pray. Okay. Father, we do uh, just come to you today, just pausing to give you thanks and praise for this Lord's day. Father, the opportunity to be able to come together. Uh, Father, to be able to lift our voices together. And Father, turn our hearts before you. Lord, be your spirit to take your word. Father, we pray that you might receive thanks and praise from our heart. Father, as we uh, lift their voices and our hearts turn to you, we ask for that you might conform us into the image of Jesus Christ. Father, we just pray that his name might be exalted, honored, and magnified uh, through our lives. Father, that you might, uh, that you might accomplish your good and perfect work in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we're going to open our hymnals, and so you two that are on the front there, you might have to go over there to get them, unless they help you. Okay, so we're going to go to number 575, 575, and when you get your place, join me in standing. Okay, number 575. <laughs> Good 
Good morning. Good morning. Just a quick message about um, the upcoming luncheon. It's the 21st, the third Sunday of this month. And I just wanted to tell the ladies, I'm not going to be making phone calls this time. I have a sign-up sheet in the back if you would please take a look at it and then help us out if you can. And also, for those of you that would like to know the menu, Mariah and I also did a menu and that's hanging at the back. And there's a sign-up sheet if you're planning to come and attend. Please sign up so we know how many chairs and how much food I can ask for. Thank you. Okay. You did that very well. Okay, so that's, like she said, the after-service luncheon that we do now each month. It's going to be July 21st and do the sign-up. Okay, and then looking at this list here, the next one on that list is Wayne Royce. He's here today. I didn't think he was going to make it. Hey, your wife got a great kick out of that. Yeah. He came in a few minutes late. Me, I'm very... And so it's like I'm looking at the parking lot and I'm like, okay, what's what's happening? And I'm not prepared to do anything. So I'm glad you're here. Okay. So now, being how we're speaking about you, I think you have an anniversary in July. Yes. And uh, how many years is it, will it be? It's going to be 42. 42? We just celebrated 39. But see, we're older than you. Yes, you are. <laughs> All right. So, and then, if I understand it right, Craig's birthday is in July. Yes. How old will Craig be now? Craig's going to be 34. 34. Wow. Well, you know what, Wayne? Uh, we're going to do something we used to do just for your benefit. We're going to make you stand up and face the congregation so that we can recognize you for these wonderful days. Stand up. No, just stand up right where you are. Yeah, just stand up and turn and face All right. It makes you feel right at home, don't it? It does. It does. It's almost like I grew up in this area. I know. I know. <laughs> okay, and then uh, let's see. Um, I have some prayer requests that I need to pass along to you. Um, first of all, See, Diane in the back, okay? She's got a medical treatment on Tuesday for her back area. She's uh, dealing with uh, something wrong in the back. So this is the beginning of treatment. So that'll be Tuesday. And then uh, on your prayer list, on the front of it, you'll see Wandy Hackett's name. And she's in the hospital down here at Warsaw. And I was down there to see her yesterday. And so what they're right now trying to do is reduce the amount of fluid buildup in her body. She's got a lot of fluid buildup. And this week she was hospitalized starting on Tuesday. And so she told me that they've been able to release seven pounds of water from her body. And they still want to do 14 more. So that tells you the situation that she's in. But she's in very good spirits. And we had a wonderful time just visiting, and we actually laughed most of the time. But uh, again, pray for her in that process. And then um, Emily came and told me about. Well, I'll just I can announce it. But what's you know Emily's? Uh, last week we had prayed for Emily's grandmother Norma, who was in above 90 years old in the hospital with a lot of health issues and. She just passed away as of yesterday. So pray for the family as they go through this transition. But the good news is her grandmother was a very devoted believer in Jesus. Amen. So now she's enjoying the best health she's ever had in heaven. So pray for the family. It's quite a transition when you have a loved one you're very close to, and then they leave this, this time here with us. So it'll be a challenge. And then last prayer request I have, and that is we got a message from Bonnie Newland that um, she's not here today because something very important uh, in her life is happening tomorrow. We don't know what it is, but she's requesting prayer, I think. So we want to pray for Bonnie. 
concerning whatever it is that's on her plate for tomorrow. Okay, so Bonnie's usually pretty faithful to be here, and only if it's extreme does she ever miss. So we really want to pray for Bonnie. So I think that's all the requests that I have. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for your, your presence here with us. We are so blessed just knowing you. We think about those, Lord, that are on our hearts and minds. We, we think about the two uh, Carmichael sisters celebrating a birthday this week, uh, reaching as they continue to progress through life. And so we ask your, your blessing on them and their family as they celebrate this time. And then we think of those that are in need you think of Diane and the medical treatment that she'll be going through on Tuesday, and we would ask that you would help her through that process. We would ask that the treatment would be very beneficial to her, that she would experience a change in her physical condition because of it, and it would be good. And then we also think of Wandy in the hospital, and we're thankful she's getting the care that she's receiving and that they've been able to remove some of the excess fluid in her body. We would ask that this week would be as successful as this past week was. That you'll continue to watch over her and help her through this medical need in her life. And then we do think of Emily Campbell's family and the passing of her beloved grandmother, Norma. We're thankful that you've taken her home and that she's now in your presence. What a comfort that is to us. But we pray right now for Emily and her family in this transition. It's always a challenge to make this transition when a loved one is no longer here with us. So continue to give them comfort, strength, and hope. And then we think of Bonnie Newland. We really love her and appreciate her presence here with us. And we think about whatever this circumstance is, we would ask that you will intervene and help her through it. Give her all the guidance and direction she needs and whatever it might be. And we will be faithful to continue to call out to you for her help. Thank you for what you're going to accomplish. And then we are thankful for Wayne being here today and for the anniversary coming up there in July with his dear wife, Sue, and also the birthday of Craig. And it's just such a, a great privilege and honor to know them and to know how well they serve you there in South Africa. And so again, we, we extend, Lord, that you would give them a really wonderful blessing as they celebrate these important times. Thank you for what you're going to accomplish, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so for our greeting hymn, we're going to go to number 580. And those of you that might be a little bit new with us, not knowing what greeting hymn means, we sing through the hymn we picked. And then we greet each other. And we just greet and greet and greet. That's kind of what we do. So uh, when you find number 580, stand with me. We'll sing through it once, and then we start greeting.
as we said on the prayer list on the front, she's going through treatments for the depression that she's battled for many, many, many years in her life. And so it's a challenge getting through those treatments. And it's not easy. And uh, so we really want to continue to pray very strongly for her. So that's what I'm going to do, okay, before we take up the collection, all right? Father in heaven, we're so thankful for your blessings and your presence with us as, as we recognize. And we do think of Roger and Mary Logston. It's so good to see Roger today. We're so glad that he could be here with us. But we think of Mary right now, especially going through this season that she's dealing with again and the challenges that she's up against. We know that you are a great physician and you can do over and above what we can think or ask concerning anyone. And so we lift up to you, Mary. We ask that you'll intervene there. Help her uh, at this time. Give her the strength she needs and the clarity she needs. And that she might return to wholeness again. We're so thankful for what you're going to accomplish. And then we ask your blessing on the giving. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Philippi and, you know, and the Philippian jailer and all of those things are going on in the chapter. 
Okay. Well, we're going to pick up with the very last, the very last statement of the last verse of chapter 16. Paul is, is, has come out of the prison. You know, the, the magistrates have come and, uh, uh, because Paul has cornered them in their, uh, in, under, under Roman law, Paul has cornered them in this little chess match that they want to play. And so they come and they beg him, okay, would you please leave and, and things. And so Paul has sufficiently uh, uh, set his ground. And it says in verse 40 that day, he and Silas, they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. And when they saw the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. Okay, it doesn't say much, does it? Well, that's pretty simple. Okay, well, I'm a fairly simple guy. I grew up in the hills here of western New York, and I'm a fairly simple guy. Um, but, you know, the interesting thing here is that uh, in this chapter, what has been going on is that as they have gone on, come on the missionary journey, they've traveled along. Uh, they started out first going out to evaluate the churches in, uh, in Galatia. And uh, then they, they've gone on from there. They've stopped at churches along the way. They've encouraged the brethren. Uh, they've strengthened them. They've taught them. They've delivered the letters from the Jerusalem Council to the various churches. And everyone was encouraged. And, uh, and as they continued on the journey, they ended up uh, uh, through the, uh, the beginning of chapter 16. They're trying to find their way. Where does the Lord want us to go now? Um, and uh, through a series of events, anyway, they end up in Troas, then the, uh, the Macedonian vision uh, calls them, and immediately they go to Philippi, uh, determining, deciding, concluding that the Lord has called us to preach the gospel there. So now the fourth uh, thing on the journey of preaching the gospel, evangelism. And they come into this city, and uh, they start down by the river where the, the ladies are gathered for prayer and Lydia gets saved in her, her household and she opens up her, her home uh, to the missionary team which is now Paul and Silas and uh, Timothy has joined them in Galatia and Dr. Luke has joined them along uh, somewhere along by Troas, Dr. Luke has joined them. So these four men have arrived in town and <laughs> She's gotten saved, and so she says, if you really believe I'm saved, come and stay at my house. And her house becomes the, uh, the local church there in Philippi, the first local church is at her house. And when Paul and Silas get out of prison, where do they go? They go to her house, because that's where the brethren gather. And so they understand that uh, in Philippi, Lydia's house was uh, the first, uh, what is the first local church. But there was, and then Paul and uh, Paul and Silas. It, it appears as if Luke remained there. It doesn't tell us that, but from from what we read, it appears as Luke kind of stayed there and um, helped the Philippian church over the next looks like maybe three, four, five years. Luke stayed there and helped Silas and Timothy and Paul go on, and the work goes out. But but it was not a formal contract, but there was this partnership that they had entered into. Uh, it wasn't necessarily a partnership of, uh, you know, that anyone uh, signed up for or really necessarily recognized, but it was a partnership uh, of the Holy Spirit that began and continued on. So then if you jump over to the book of Philippians, the book of Philippians in chapter one, in Philippians chapter one, um, you know, Paul is, is writing the letter to Philippi from, from the Roman prison. And as he, as he writes the letter, you know, he says, I, you know, verse 3, I thank my God upon all my remembrance of you, uh, always offering prayer with joy and every prayer for you all. And you of your, um, verse 5, uh, your participation in the gospel from the first day until that. Now, uh, that, that uh, participation in the gospel, some call it a partner their partnership in the gospel from the first day to now. The old King James um, used uh, fellowship. Koinonia is the word, it's, it's, a, it's a verb. I use fellowship, you know, two fellows in a ship, and it's only as they actively work together in sailing that ship, one at the rudder, one at the sail, that the ship moves forward. 
and fellowship, koinonia, partnership. It's, a, it's an action word. It's not a word, it's not a preposition. It's an action word. And, uh, uh, you know, so Paul, you know, he says, you know, for being confident in this very thing, he who has begun a good work in you will perform it until the very day of Jesus Christ. And uh, verse 6. But that confidence of Paul goes back to what he has seen, their participation, their partnership with Paul from the first day until now, convinced Paul that God was going to continue to work in their hearts and lives until the day Jesus comes and takes us home. And so there's this partnership that they had entered into. No one signed up for it. No one really necessarily maybe even recognized that this partnership had begun. But nonetheless, it did. So now in verse, uh, as Paul is writing down through here, you know, he says, you know, I have you on my heart, you know, and, you know, I, I think about you. And then he goes on in verse 9 through 11. He says, and this is how I'm praying for you, that you're, Love may abound yet more and more on judgment and, and, and uh, knowledge that you may be filled with the fruits of righteousness of our Christ Jesus. You might, you know, he, how he's praying for them specifically. And then he turns in verse 12 and he says, But I want you should understand, brethren, that the things which have happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. Uh, the, the greater progress of the gospel. Uh, and so the question we want to ask is, uh, you know, as we, as we look at this, it seems to be that there's this, this partnership in the gospel that Paul refers to in verse 5 that led to the progress of the gospel. Or, uh, or there's, this, there's this active participation that God used to the, for the pioneer advancement, if you want to get to a more descriptive how the Greek actually says it, pioneer advancement of the gospel. And so there's this, walking through the letter here, there is this interaction, this, uh, Paul is describing how this partnership works, and how this partnership has been uh, the very thing that God has used to further the gospel. And so what we'd like to do is we'd just like to take this uh, this few minutes, and we'd like to first of all consider what is this partnership that is being referred to here? Uh, this this unwritten, um, you know, it's not a legal document or anything, because technically, as Pastor was saying, Pastor was saying, you know, at some point we entered into a partnership. You and uh, our family, we entered into a partnership, and as we have um, actively participated in things, the gospel has gone forth. And so it's, it's not changed. Uh, it's interesting because every once in a while I'll, I'll, uh, I'll come across someone and they'll say, well, we do missions differently. You know. And, um, okay, well, that's fine, but um, I still think the Bible is pretty clear how this how this this thing is supposed to work so let's consider this this partnership that Paul is is referring to that they have entered into and that God has used in the first century let's pray for us. father we uh, just come to you today we do uh, just pause to give you thanks for giving us your word be a lamp unto our feet and a light for our path. We thank you, Father, and praise you. Uh, Father, for we have the words of the living God. Uh, Father, we hear so much from so many. And, you know, most of it is just uh, hot air. Uh, but Father, we thank you that your word is true. Your word endures from generation to generation. Uh, Father, that your word is an extension of your very person. So Father, we thank you for giving it to us. We thank you for giving us your spirit to be our teacher, our instructor. Father, we ask that you would take your word and you would use it in our lives and encourage us, Father, help us, uh, Father, to be more fruitful, uh, Father, for your work, for your cause, for your kingdom. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So as we look at this, uh, the first thing that we notice here is that Paul says, um, for your fellowship, your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. So as, as Paul is referring to this uh, from the first day until now, he's referring back to that verse 40 that we just read before. He's referring back to that moment when they walked out that this partnership in the gospel, they began to uh, actively participate in their partnership. And Paul, and on, on his part, as we look at it, it was a, it was a partnership of uh, persistence because it had gone on for quite some time. Now, uh, I'm not sure, Pastor, if you can remember how long ago it was that, when I first came here. Can you remember how many years ago that was? It was probably close to 20 years ago. Exactly, at least 20 or more. So, um, and you know, for Paul and the Philippian church, it was probably not quite that much, but it was every bit of 15 years. So it was, it was quite a while that this had gone on, this partnership of there. And uh, as uh, Paul, remember, as Paul had left from Philippi, and as he had gone out, he came to Thessalonica. And as he was in Thessalonica, you know, Silas and Timothy were there with him, and they were there for three weeks. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But then, um, you know, then they, they got chased out of there. They ended up going over to Berea. And then a riot breaks out in Berea. And then Paul goes on to Athens, and from Athens he sends Timothy and Silas uh, they're, they're back, they're still in the area of Thessalonica, and he sends word back to them, he says, hey, meet me in, Athens, in, in Corinth. And so Paul's in Athens, and then <laughs> Paul goes on to Corinth, and then uh, Silas and Timothy join him in Corinth. Now, from the book of Thessalonians, we find that Silas and Timothy are going from Paul and Corinth, going back to Thessalonica, Paul and Corinth, and they're going back and forth somewhat. Uh, it seems like they had a, a rather extensive ministry during that time in the Thessalonian church. But Paul was in Corinth for the better part of two years. And yet, even during that time, the Philippian church, they still actively participated in various ways, the Apostle Paul. Now, some we know, some we don't. But then Paul went from um, Corinth and he, uh, he goes about, um, travels back, he goes back to Jerusalem, he ends up in Ephesus for three years. After Ephesus, he comes through, and he comes uh, through Philippi, going back and forth, uh, taking the collection for the Jerusalem saints, and then he goes on up to, uh, he goes on up to Jerusalem, where uh, when he arrives in Jerusalem, Paul is arrested. And when he's arrested there in Jerusalem, the, the gospel was still going forward. And you can find various ways in the book of Acts where it's recorded. Different people heard the gospel. Different people heard about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Different people got saved. The gospel was continuing to go forward. And then Paul from there ended up for a couple of years in Caesarea Philippi. Uh, he was arrested, or he had been arrested in Jerusalem, sent up to Caesarea, and just kind of held there. Left in, kind of just left in limbo. But the Lord's work didn't stop. The gospel didn't stop because of that. The uh, work continued on. Then Paul ends up traveling across the Mediterranean, the shipwreck and all of the different things, ends up in, Jeru er, in Rome for two years, where it tells us that all who came to him during that two years, he freely preached the gospel. And so in all of these ways, the, the, uh, the gospel had continued to progress. In all of these corners of the Roman world there, uh, the new good news of Jesus Christ had been heard. Places it had never been heard before, now the good news was known. There were some who had come to faith, others had turned their back, uh, the Jews had, had fought and, and rejected, but the Spirit of God was still working. So there was a fellowship, a participation, uh, a partnership of persistence. And in all these different ways, the gospel had gone forth. But you know, you can read right here in verse 13, the, the very next verse, Philippians 1.13, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become 
well known to all the Praetorian Guard and everyone else. So even there, uh, uh, in Rome, the Praetorian Guard in the in the, uh, the 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 good news of Jesus Christ has been heard by these soldiers. That people have come to Paul, these soldiers have heard. As a matter of fact, in verse 14, it also says, so that many of the brethren waxing confident by my bonds are much more bold to preach the, the gospel without fear. And so many of the believers there in Rome, um, because Paul's arrest and Paul continues to preach the gospel, there were those who were much more bold to preach Christ without worrying. They, it encouraged them to speak up. Uh, as a matter of fact, you go over to chapter 4, verse 22. Chapter 4, verse 22. As Paul sends his final greetings, he says, All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. Whether it be household servants from uh, the emperor's house, or whether it be some of these Roman soldiers, or uh, we, we don't know. There's no record of any family member coming to salvation in Christ at this early stage. But someone, there were some in Caesar's household, family, servants, slaves, soldiers, whoever they were, that had come to faith in Jesus Christ. And in all of these ways, and in all of these places, the gospel had continued to go forth. Whether someone had believed and received, or whether someone had rejected, whether someone heard what was going on and they came to hear, or somebody heard what was going on and said, I'm not going there. Everyone uh, in these various places, everyone had some opportunity to respond. And it reminds me, in South Africa, I was listening to the testimony of one young man. And there was this time in Extension 4 where we would uh, we would send out the, the we would send the Baki over to Extension 4. It's not that far, maybe a half a mile across the township. And we would go over there and uh, and and uh, this kid that had come got saved, he was inviting all of his friends. They were he was about a junior in in high school at the time. I think he was actually 16 at the time, so maybe he was like in about 10th grade. But in that particular street, uh, he invited, I mean, everybody. And, and it was like there was times where we had to send both my Bakis over because there were so many of them that, that were coming. But what happened was when the Baki or the Baki, you know what a Baki is? It's a pickup truck, okay. My, my, my old Ford pickup truck, okay? And when, when I would show up on the street, everyone knew the truck, and you know, the, the, the hollers would go up and down the street, and everybody knew it was time for church. And we would, we would bring 20, 30, sometimes even 40 of them over to, over to Home Fulani uh, for Wednesday night for different things. And youth night was pretty, was very common on Friday nights and, and things like that. And uh, Yanga, and there was, I don't know how many, but Yanga got saved, and there were some other ones that, that trusted in Christ. But that what happened slowly but surely, different, uh, the crowds started turning away. They stopped coming, and pretty soon Yanga was the only one. He held out for quite a long time, then he moved away. We didn't see him for several years. Um, he moved back into the area here maybe a year or so ago, but um, but it was interesting. So so on those Wednesday uh, and Friday nights, when the Baki would come up, the echoes would go down the street. It's church, it's church. And all of their friends, all the friends, everyone up and down the street would hear that, and they knew it was time to go to church. They would choose to come, or they would choose not to. But the, the question is, did they all have the opportunity? Absolutely. They all knew what, they, what this was about. They all had the opportunity. So whether they chose to get in the Baki, come over to church, and actually listen, and get saved, or whether they didn't, it was still their choice, correct? No one held a gun to their head, at least I didn't. But I don't think anybody held a gun to anyone's head and said, you're getting in the Baki. Or in the pickup truck. No 
Level 4 pickup. Okay? Um, but interesting, interesting thing was about three or four years later, they all, well, they all along stopped coming. Never saw any of them again for I don't know how many years. Uh, but what had happened was a group of them, after they had finished school or quit school, whatever they did, they kind of joined, they kind of formed a little gang there. And they, they had their little gang. And what happened was they got involved in something over at Kailicha. And on this particular Sunday afternoon, about 4.30 in the afternoon, a car shows up. Two guys get out with AK-47s. And in this Shabin, on that street, the AK-47s fired, killing several of them. And the other two, there was two of them that got away and they ran. They ran down the streets, the very same streets where I would stop. They run down that next street over, and I know I can see the exactly the streets where they're running, where they turned, and then they get around that corner. There's another street that goes out to the main drag, and they jumped up that half a block up that next street, and they caught up to them on that street. And the AK-47s fired again and shot them down in the street, and they disappeared. And you know, the same ones that had a chance to get into that body Maybe some of them did. I don't know. They had that chance to get into that body, to come over and to hear the word, hear the gospel. What can you say? A sad reality of the neighborhood where the church is, but um, it is where it is. The echoes on the street for months, the echoes were church, church church, church, and then they weren't. Then the only echoes that were heard were the AK-47s. And at least four or five of them were dead on that afternoon. But they all had their chance. You see, if you had never partnered with us, we would never been there. And they would have never even had a chance. So praise the Lord. God is good. They had a chance. So this was a fellowship of persistence from the first day until now. And you know, we're at the stage where people have been asking us, where are you going to retire? You know, I got a church in Florida. They're expecting us to retire in Florida. Because that's what people do. Um, you know, of course, you're from New York, you know, and if you if you grew up, it's, it's hard not to want to retire in this part of the world. Uh, because, you know, after all, you know, you know, I got the dirt in my blood. Uh, what can I say? But, you know, my, my children are in Chicago, so you're going to retire in Chicago. And my wife and I have talked about it. It's, it seems like the last few years, I guess, when my hair, my hair turned gray, people started asking. I don't, know. I don't know what that's about, Pastor, but that's the way it is. But we pretty much have decided that we're we're just going to continue on with what the Lord has given us, and we're just going to continue to trust Him. And even now, we're you know here we are, and I'm you know we're going to build another children's home, um, you know, and I've got to build another church when I get back next month. I got to start on that, and, you know, and uh, you know even my brother, you know, he's you think you can. You think you still got the strength to do that? I said, well, I don't have to. The Lord does. And, you know, we're determined that we want to just continue to trust the Lord and, and, and continue to move forward until Jesus takes us home, which might only be next Tuesday, you know. Okay. But, um, you know, this was a partnership of persistence. And, and we have determined that we want to be faithful until that last day. We want to be faithful. But you know, it, was, it wasn't just a fellowship of persistence, a partnership of persistence. There was also this partnership of prayer. And you know, when we send our prayer letters, uh, I'm not sure if somebody said, 
you know, we, we are thankful that, you know, there's always something encouraging in your prayer rooms. I, I think, did you share that, sir? Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, we always, we have learned that um, there's always enough discouragements. You don't have to worry about that. There's always going to be discouragements and difficulties. There's always things to pray about. But there is also always something. There's always something to be encouraged about. And, uh, and uh, we thank you for uh, partnering with us in this. And, you know, you look down at verse 19 of chapter 1. You know, there's, there's this partnership in prayer. Paul, back in chapter 1, verse 9 through 11, Paul says, this is how I'm praying for you. Uh, but now, we come to chapter 1, verse 19. Paul says, I know that this will turn out to my salvation through your prayers and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Well, that's rather interesting that Paul says that. He says, he says through your prayers. Now, the word prayers here is supplication, specific request. And one of the things when we left for the field, there was a couple different churches that we talked with, uh, the missions committee and the pastors and things like that. And they gave us, uh, you know, some... And one of, the, one of the churches, we actually entered into a covenant partnership with that church that we will, we will let them know every month, uh, we will let them know what's going on and what, need, what do we need to pray about. And they had to, you know, it was like, well, obviously, you know, there's some months where it just isn't going to happen, but, you know, on a regular basis. And, and so we understood that because we had in our church... We were supporting uh, a couple, and we hadn't heard from them in two years. And we contacted, we tried to contact them. We contacted their mission board to get them to contact us. And they still didn't give us any information what's going on or anything. And so I was on the missions committee at that time, and I, I saw, okay, so I saw from the other side of this thing how this happened. So I understand this. But Paul says here, through your prayers, that specific request, okay, something specific. So if we're going to ask you to pray with us about something, it needs to be something specific that you can pray about. It also needs to be something that when the Lord answers, we can say this is how the Lord answered. We can see what the Lord answered. I talked with a guy and he said, you know, when he prays, he says, God bless all the little children. Well, that's an interesting prayer, but it's not specific enough to, to even know if God even heard it, let alone answered it. Uh, so Paul says here, you know, pray specifically for him. Now, he goes on to say that this will turn out to my salvation, my deliverance, through your prayers and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. So what Paul is saying is that as you pray... God will supply, God will answer, and I will be saved. I will be delivered. That's what Paul is saying. And that's, his, that's his full expectation here. As you pray, God will answer, and I will be delivered. If you don't pray, God's not going to answer, and I'm not going to get delivered. Right? Reverse cause and effect. And so Paul is saying, no. The question would be, well, what exactly is Paul asking them to pray about? Now, it could be Paul is under arrest in Rome, and Paul is going to have to stand before Emperor Nero. And he's going to, you know, when he stands before the emperor, he's going to get the thumbs down and the thumbs up. It's pretty simple justice, okay? You don't get 20 years or five days or anything like that. You get the thumbs down or the thumbs up. The thumbs up is what? You know, you're out of here. The thumbs down is, well, you're out in a different way, okay? You're off with the head when that when the thumb goes down. That's the way the Roman justice system worked. And if Paul was found guilty of whatever he was accused of treason against Rome, which is what they were trying to accuse him of, then you know there's only one thumbs down. And for a Roman citizen, that's off with the head. Uh, but you know Paul, you know could be saying, well. Pray for me that I, you know, that I'm delivered from the, you know, the threat of death. You know, because that's a real possibility. But, you know, Paul's not saying that because he goes on to say, 
you know, verse 21 and 22, you know, I, you know, me to live is Christ to die is gain. Well, whether I live or die really is not that big of a deal. But then in verse 22, he says, you know, that, that you know, if I remain, if I live on in the flesh and remain, then, you know, this will result in fruitful labor. And then he goes down in verse 25, I'm convinced and I know that I will remain and continue for your uh, progress in faith. So Paul goes on to say there, and then over in chapter 2, I believe verse 24, Paul says, I, I myself will come to you shortly. So Paul expects to live. So he's not saying, pray for me that, you know, I'm delivered from the threat of death. Well, maybe Paul is saying, you know, that pray for me that I'm delivered from this unjust in prison. You know, he shouldn't be there in the first place. Even, even back in Caesarea, they recognized that. If he hadn't appealed to Caesar, we could have let him go already. So, you know, maybe he's saying, I mean, if you were unjustly imprisoned in, you know, Pakistan or someplace, you know, you would contact the consulate um, and hopefully the State Department would care enough to actually do so. Maybe they would, maybe they wouldn't. But you would hope they would, right? But, you know, Paul's not talking about that because he expects to be released. He does not expect that. So what is Paul asking them to specifically do? Well, I would suggest to you that what Paul is asking them to pray about is this one thing. Uh, actually, if you jump back in your Bible, one page back to the left, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 19. You know, pray for me that utterance may be given me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel as I ought, as I ought to do, for which I am an ambassador in chains. So Paul's asking the Ephesians, pray for me that when I stand before Nero, that I boldly speak up and share the gospel. And I would suggest to you that's what Paul is as telling the Philippians, pray for me that when I stand before Nero, that I don't shrink back in fear in any way, but I boldly proclaim the gospel. I mean, think about it. You know, if you're going to have, uh, you're going to have dinner with somebody, say you're going to have, oh, I know, I know who. Let's say you're going to have dinner with um, President, former President Trump next Tuesday. I don't know why next Tuesday, but next Tuesday. And so you send out, uh, do, you, do you do email? Do you do email? Okay. Uh, do you do, do you do send out text? Do you text? No, you don't do that? Okay. Um, WhatsApp. Do you do WhatsApp here? That's big. That's big over there. WhatsApp is big. But okay. Well, whatever. You're going to let people know, right? Maybe you don't have time to send out letters, so maybe you're going to send out your friends. Hey, you know, I'm having I'm having dinner with uh, you know President Trump. I don't can I, can I call him that? Okay. Um, I'm not sure if I can or not, but I'm going to call him. Okay. I'm having dinner with President Trump. Okay. Now. Let me ask you the question. Are you going to ask people, pray for me, or are you going to let people know? Um, for what? Or do you think maybe that the Lord arranged that for you to have dinner with President Trump next Tuesday night because he, he wants you to share the gospel with him? Maybe. Would you be bold enough? I mean, I, I don't know. I've never talked with the guy, and I probably never will. But I think he can be pretty bold when he's in a room. He doesn't have a problem speaking up, I would think. It's kind of the impression I get. Would you be able to somewhere in there insert and, you know, say, hey, you know, Mr. President, I'm concerned about your soul. You know, you're not as young as you used to. You know, maybe there's some things here that we need to talk about. You know, Jesus. And share the gospel with him. Would you, would, you, would you be bold enough to do that? Would you be bold enough to ask your friends, ask the folks at the church, pray for me, I'm having dinner with President Trump. Pray that I have the open door for the gospel. To share the gospel with him. You see, because that's the situation Paul is in. And he doesn't want to miss this opportunity. 
This is a part of divine, uh, a divine appointment. And I don't want to miss the opportunity to share the gospel with you. And I would hope that if I was in that situation, I would do the same. I'm not an actual evangelist. I have to, I plan on these things. I have to plan an event that I'm going to share the gospel with. So right now i got two people on my list that I'm going to try and get together with while I'm still here in New York before I leave to share the gospel. So I have to plan it. And I have to figure out, okay, uh, where, how am I going to, how am I going to, you know, get together with these people and, you know, and, and share the gospel. So I have to plan it. I'm not an actual evangelist or anything. I have to do the work of an evangelist. But Paul's saying, pray for me. That I open my mouth, that I speak up like I should. That I say the very thing that God has appointed me to say. To uh, share the gospel. So you know, this, this partnership that they had, uh, had, had been one that, that had been going on for years. It had one been a, a partnership of not only persistence, but a partnership of prayer. Paul prayed for them, and they prayed for Paul. And in this situation, this is how you can pray for me, that I might accomplish God's appointed purpose for this, this day. Did Paul ever stand before Nero? I have no idea. But according to what we know in Scripture, we would expect that God did answer the prayer. God did allow him to stand before Nero, and Nero heard the gospel. No indication whatsoever that Nero uh, listened or responded in any way, shape, or form. But that's not the point. God was just in giving him this chance. But it was also a fellowship of personal involvement, a partnership here. That, notice what it says over in chapter 2. You know, Paul in chapter 2, you know, he's kind of turned the corner. And he says, you know, in verse uh, 19, he says, you know, I hope to send Timothy to you shortly. So Timothy, he would come there, and Timothy would check, would see how well you're doing, and Timothy would give me an encouraging report. And so Paul is saying, you know, I'd like to send Timothy so I'd have the hope of encouragement. Timothy would come, and Timothy would be able to... Uh, be able to say, uh, talk about you in such a way that it would encourage my heart. You know, not all things that happen on the mission field are encouraging, Pastor. I don't know if you ever noticed. There are some discouragements out there. Do you know that? Yeah. Okay, well, just so you know now. Okay. <laughs> and, you know, we have our days, we have our discouragement. There's many times on Sunday, my wife and I will go home after wherever we've been, and we say, well, this is one we don't want to, we, we don't want to remember too long, okay? This was one of those weeks. Have you ever had those, one of those weeks? Okay, well, we've had a few along the way. And I suspect probably, you know, the Philippine church probably had the same situation. You know, there were days where things were very encouraging, but there were probably days when things weren't so encouraging. Paul says, you know, Timothy be able to go and do an assessment of the situation be able to come back and give me an encouraging report. That even though there's some discouragements, there's some positive things that are happening here. But notice what he goes on to say. You know, he says, well, I can't send Timothy because I have to keep Timothy here until I find out how my situation turns out. But notice this. Um, in verse, well, we don't want to, we're not going to take time with that. Okay. Uh, verse 25. I thought, therefore, it was necessary to send to Paphroditus, my brother, uh, fellow worker, fellow soldier, uh, but your messenger and he who ministered to my wants. Now, as we look at Epaphroditus here, this, this man of Epaphroditus, we don't know uh, a lot about him, but when Paul says that Epaphroditus is has come there to Rome, and he's become Paul's uh, brother, companion, uh, co-worker, fellow worker, and fellow soldier. Uh, so they had fought together in the fight, the good fight of faith. They had worked together in the work of the gospel. Uh, they had become uh, brothers, companions, uh, one of another, as, uh, as uh, children of God. And so during this time, however long he was there, he had uh, won a place along um, Paul's uh, heart and his hands. 
in the work of the gospel. Paul was chained, and Epaphroditus was there to help him. So the church here had said to Epaphroditus, by the way, your messenger, the word messenger there is, is apostolos. Um, and so in, in, the, in the New Testament, the word apostle is used in a specific way of the 12 and the apostle Paul. It's also used in a general way of, uh, of what we would term missionary, the missionaries of the churches. And so we would have to look at this as um, Epaphroditus was a missionary from the church that was sent to help the apostle Paul during this time. He was sent with a message. He was sent with a mission help the Apostle Paul. And so the, the Philippian church had sent one of their own, go down, take a message to Paul, and, and stay there and help him. And so Epaphroditus had done that. And Paul says, you know, because we have no record of him back in Acts chapter 16, but he's part of the church now. Somewhere along the way he got saved, became a part of the church, and the church had sent him to Paul in Rome to help him. Now, the interesting thing is it says, he who ministered to my wants, my need. The word ministered there is the word that has to do with, uh, it comes from liturgy. It's the word that is used in the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament of the priest and Levites ministering at the altar or ministering in the tabernacle or ministering in the sacrifices or in the various ways that they did. Uh, it means to administer sacred and holy service unto God. Um, and it doesn't tell us how what he did. But whatever he did was a holy offering and sacrifice unto God. And that, that's important. That it, because what it reminds us of this, it does not matter what we do to help in mission. Whatever we do is considered a holy offering and sacrifice to God. Now, Epaphroditus took it to a new level. Because Epaphroditus, it tells us here, he, you know, he's longing for them all in verse 26. You know, they had heard that he was sick. And so he wanted to go back to them to show them, no, I'm all right. But notice verse 27, it says he, he was sick to the point of death. So, the point, uh, the, the sick to the point of death means right on the, and, and you could stand here, it would really be helpful if this dropped off about 200 feet. And then you could really, you know, see when you're right, when you're right on that edge, you know, and you, you, you just can't quite, you know, you're right, that's where he was, he was right there. Um, on, on, the, on the point of death. Oh, as a matter of fact, verse 30. <laughs> Look at verse 30. Why was he at the point of death according to verse 30? Because for the work of Christ, he was on the brink of, he was on the edge of death. Interesting. So here's Epaphroditus. Sent from the church. Remember, they had, they had this partnership, unwritten partnership, not a legal partnership, a spiritual partnership. And he had been sent to help Paul. And he had come with a message, he had come with uh, a gift, he had come with instructions to help Paul. And he helped, in whatever way he helped, he helped to the point of death to help Paul. That's personal involvement. That's personal sacrifice. The church personally sacrificed one of their own to go to Paul. Epaphroditus personally sacrificed. He was willing to sacrifice even his life to help in the cause of Christ. So we see that, you know, there was this partnership that had been going on for years, a partnership of persistence, a partnership of prayer that had been going on, that God was using, God was actually answering, a partnership of personal involvement, that they had personally become involved in Paul's ministry and work by sending one of their own. But come over to chapter 4. Notice in chapter 4. Uh, I'm going to skip over verse 13. 
Verse 13, I do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We're going to jump to verse 14. Nevertheless, you have done well that you did share in my affliction. Verse 15, you know, you yourself know that, uh, you know, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but you Philippians only. Uh, for even in Thessalonica, once and again, you sent unto my needs. And uh, down in verse uh, 18, I have received uh, everything in full. I have uh, abundance. I have what you have sent from Epaphroditus. So verse 18, Epaphroditus had come with finances from the church, a gift from the church that he had uh, been uh, instructed to deliver to Paul. And Paul says, I've received it from Epaphroditus. But you notice what he says here in verse 14 and 15. You know, you shared with my need. And so they have shared with his need. But in verse 15 he says, when I departed from Macedonia, way back, remember that verse we started with in verse 40? When at, at, from, at that point, when Paul left town and marched out of there, that's where Paul's talking about right here. And Paul says, you know, no church, uh, no church gave. You were the only one. You were the only church that gave. Um, verse 15. For even in Thessalonica, you sent once and again. Now, you remember in Acts chapter 17 when Paul arrives in Thessalonica. Do you remember what happened? It tells us that as Paul came to Thessalonica, you know, as his habit was, he would go down to the synagogue and he would uh, he would basically debate with the Jews and he would go show them the Old Testament scriptures and how Jesus of Nazareth has fulfilled the Old Testament scripture. So on Sabbath day, he's there at the synagogue, he's uh, di uh, disputing with the Jews, showing that Jesus is the Christ. And back in Philippi, what is the day after the Sabbath? The day after the Sabbath. If the Sabbath over here in the synagogue was the Sabbath day, what day of the week is that? Saturday. Saturday. So what is the day after Saturday? <laughs> Sunday. Back here in Philippi, in Lydia's house where the brethren got together, the brethren come together on the Lord's day, the first day of the week, as Paul had given the the custom to the churches, and as they all gathered on Sunday, and as they're gathered together, they're there, uh, and somebody says, how is Paul doing? What's he up to? We probably should send him a gift. Remember when he left Macedonia, they sent, they gave him. He's down in Thessalonica. Oh, well here, somebody take this down to Thessalonica. So during the week, Paul comes, somebody comes to Thessalonica with a gift from Philippi to Paul in Thessalonica. Now you say to me, well, it doesn't say that. Well, what are you saying? Wait, 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 wait. Catch up. So on Saturday, the second Sabbath, where is Paul? He's in the synagogue reasoning with the Jews. What did he do all week long? He's making tents with Priscilla and Aquila. Remember? Anyway, he's in the synagogue. And what happened? He's debating with the Jews. And he goes out. Back here the next day. What is the day after Saturday? What's happening in Philippi on Lydia's house? The believers are gathering. And what did they do? They took a collection. Somebody said we should send some money to Paul. They sent some money to Paul during the week. Paul, the third Saturday, Paul is in the synagogue reasoning with the Jews. And what happened? A riot breaks out, and Paul is chased out of town. But back in Philippi, on uh, the following day, what is the following day? Sunday at, where are we right here? We're at Lydia's house. And what happens? They take a collection, but Paul's no longer down there in Thessalonica. He's gone on from there to Berea, and then he goes on from there to Athens. Once and again, you sent to my need when I was in Thessalonica. They quit the third week. Why? Because he was no longer there. He's gone on. Oh, he wasn't making tents there after all. I remember now. He wasn't making tents until he got down there to Asia in Corinth. So once and again. But you know what? 
in 2 Corinthians, it tells us that while I was in Corinth, a church in Macedonia, remember these Philippian believers? While Paul was in Corinth, they finally caught up with him again with a gift. And so once and again in Thessalonica, again when he left that region, ended up in Corinth, again they sent money to help the Apostle Paul. In Corinth, he was making tents. And in Corinth, once the money came, Paul was now able to devote himself wholly to the preaching of the gospel. So, then what Paul is taking a collection for the Jerusalem saints. He's been in Ephesus, he's been planning this, he's been uh, talking with the Corinthians, he's been writing back and forth to the Corinthians. And he comes up to Philippi, and the Philippians says, hey, Paul, good to see you. Where are you going? Paul says, well, I'm on my way to Corinth because a year ago, the Corinthians said they wanted to give to the Jerusalem saints who are really suffering. And guess what? The Philippians says, well, why can't we give? Paul says, hey, you guys are poor. Things are tough for you, you know, and I understand. They said, no, we want to give. And it goes in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, those first verses. They beg Paul for the opportunity to be part of this gift. Now, Paul has to send the letter in Titus down to Corinth because some of these Philippians might come down with me to Corinth, and they're going to come down with me to Corinth, and they're going to see you Corinthians not quite ready. You don't have it together yet. Well, I'm going to be embarrassed. Just think how embarrassed you should be. So they gave again. And now again here in verse uh, 18, I have received from Epaphroditus again the things that were sent from <laughs> and so the Philippian church there had entered into this silent partnership with the Apostle Paul from the first day until now. They had prayed for him. They had partnered with him. They had participated with him. And they had purposefully given to help the Apostle Paul in the furtherance of the gospel. So the gospel didn't go into those parts. Well, you know, in what, what year are we in? 2024. Things have not changed a whole lot. We were able to be uh, serving the Lord there in Cape Town, South Africa, because you have partnered with us. You don't know how many times, you know, we send out a prayer letter and we get a we get a little note from Pastor Doc. A word of encouragement. You, you don't know how much that encourages us sometimes, Pastor God. That might be that might be that week where you know that was one of those weeks. You know, and, and a word of encouragement, Pastor God. Uh, you know, um, but we've been able to we've been able to serve the Lord and and you know um, plant some churches. We've been able to minister to some needy. We've been able to help people that needed help. Because you partnered with us. And we thank you. But you know, the interesting thing about this letter, and it's, it's a hard thing to get a hold of, because Paul, in the first chapter, is writing to each individual Philippian. He's not writing to the church as a whole. He's writing to each member of the church. You Philippians, plural, or every one of our plural pronouns, as Paul is referring to. And so what he's saying is each one of you have participated in various ways. And you know, sometimes we, in the, the, the modern world, we, we, can, we can hide behind the church and participate in missions through the church, but we never get personally involved like a Epaphroditus. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you for your partnership. I'd like to thank you. Because, because you have partnered with us, we've been able to serve the Lord in South Africa. We've been able to work with close people, and we, and we are just so thankful for the privilege we have of serving the Lord. And you know, like Paul says in chapter 1, he makes a statement, you know, you know, I know that if I live on, it will result in fruitful labor. And this is my expectation. And so, 
uh, as long as as long as the Lord gives me strength, and gives me health, and gives me breath, it is it is my purpose, my desire that my life might bear fruit for Christ. Because if you're not bearing fruit for Christ, you're not really living. Oh, you might be alive, but you're not real. I don't know if that clock is right or not. Is that clock right? Father, we do uh, just come to you today and give you thanks and praise for your goodness. We thank you, Father, for calling us into the partnership of the gospel. Father, to be able to join together, to be able to serve together, to be able to uh, make the name of Christ known, uh, Father, to the far corners of the world. Not all of us can go, but Father, we thank you that some of us can. Father, thank you for giving us that opportunity. Thank you, Father, for uh, giving us, uh, Father, partners here, uh, Father, to enable us uh, to uh, serve you there. Father, we give you thanks and praise for your goodness, for your mercies and your love. Good to be in the house of the Lord, and, and it's good to welcome one of our own back, and to hear what's been accomplished, and uh, one that gets the glory is God, right? To God be the glory, great things He's done. I'm going to ask Wayne, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and make your way to the hallway, right? And then I'm going to have the rest of you join me in standing. And we'll have a word of prayer. And then we'll be dismissed. All right? So join me in standing. I think Donald will pray for us. And if you've got a gift or something you'd like to share, that would be appreciated. Okay. So, Donald, lead us in a prayer. Lord. We give you thanks for Wayne's message today on the partnership. I'm sure that we will hear more of this in the future. We thank you for that message. We also ask you to be with Wayne's ministry in South Africa, Lord. Bless him, lift him up spiritually, put your hands of protection around him, and give him courage also to speak to those two people that he has in his heart, not to, not to Lord Jesus. And we thank you for what he will say to them. And we pray that they will receive Jesus into their life. I ask also, Lord, to bless my brothers and sisters here today who come to give you praise and glory and thanks for all that you do with them and for them. And we pray for the people in the community also. And we ask, Lord, that you open up their hearts that those who don't know you personally Today will be a day of salvation, and they will call upon your name and receive you into life as their Lord and Savior. And we thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.